this is bigger than protecting our our private lands, our homes from wildfires. What I'm talking about here is something that Aldo Leopold, John Muir, uh, David Brower, none, none of our favored conservationists had to even contemplate. It's becoming involved with trees and forests at a scale they could not have imagined. Welcome to Episode 5 of Climate, Trees, and Legacy. I'm Connie Barlow. Today is July 3rd, 2014, and I'm standing in front of a Douglas fir. Uh, this is in a subdivision, a uh, very undeveloped su subdivision, about 8,300 foot elevation on the west slope of Mount Blanca, southern Colorado. And if you look up here, you'll see something very special that I'm gonna talk about later in this program. One day later, July 4th, still on the slope of Mount Blanca here. This being Independence Day in the USA, I think the most patriotic thing I can do is finally finish off this video. It's taken quite a while to do the online research. I've been on location in three different places in Colorado and a few extra. But the thing that's distinctive about this episode five, Rocky Mountain Trees in Climate Peril, is that unlike the previous three, this one is not dealing with a single species, but with 10. Now, 90% of this episode is going to be excerpts from the highly illustrated talk I gave in Durango, Colorado, June 24th, on this same topic to an audience of about 40 people. And as usual, I'm going to end with the lessons that I derive uh, from having spent time here looking into this issue for these 10 species of conifer. But first, before I launch into those video excerpts of my presentation in Durango, uh, there's two things I'd like to do. One is to mention that the climate march here, the marchers now are in southwestern Nebraska, a town called Culbertson. And again, they're going to be marching all the way to Washington, D.C. to arrive there just before Election Day in November. The second thing I always like to do is anything important that's come up with the science of climate change, that is our understanding of how it works, what's been going on with climate change, and any climate action, that is, action to forestall climate change, to really start beginning uh, to mitigate the carbon dioxide going into the air. I always like to mention that. You'll hear one uh, such news that I presented in Durango, but here I'd like to mention something that just happened a week ago. The federal district court in Colorado overturned a federal agency, U.S. Forest Service and BLM decision that approved expansion of a coal mine on public lands in western Colorado. And the very important thing is that the judge overturned it expressly because the social costs, the economic costs, of putting more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere that would necessarily come from continued coal mining had not adequately uh, been considered by the federal agencies. So the judge threw out the approval of the extension. That, of course, paves the way for more agencies, more judges to pay attention to the deleterious consequences of the continuing burning of fossil fuels, especially the most carbon-rich fossil fuels, and that is coal. So now, back to my talk in Durango, Colorado, June 24th, on Rocky Mountain Trees in Climate Peril. Well, my name's Connie Barlow, and what I'm going to be doing uh, this evening is introducing you to a worldview shift beyond the shift we've all already made. And that is, we're all reconciled to the fact that a lot of our trees and forests are going down to bark field, okay? And we know that's ongoing, it's happening, it breaks our heart. Michael and I drove here from Wolf Creek Pass. I could not believe, I could not believe the devastation since three or four years ago, the last time we went through there. 
So we've all kind of adjusted to that, how sad it is. This is going to be the next step of sadness. We're going to be taking a look at how climate is going to continue to change, even under a realistic best case scenario. So we've all seen this chart before, okay? And here we are, last May, for the very first time last May, we had a day that got up over 400 parts per million CO2 in the atmosphere. This past April was the first month that averaged more than that. Now obviously, uh, the, the, the planet breathes, more CO2 comes out in the northern hemisphere during the winter, and then it, comes, it gets sucked back down into our plants uh, during the spring and summer and so forth. But we have really hit a threshold, really hit a threshold. So we're all accepting of this. What does it mean for our forests? To put this in perspective, uh, the week beginning March 30th, 2014, uh, averaged over 400 parts per million. One year ago, one year ago, that same week was 398, and 10 years before that, 379. We can see how it's going up. So I'm going to be taking you through a worldview shift here. Uh, when I experienced it, it was devastating for me. Right? I've loved trees for a long time. I've been working with trees. I'll tell you what I do, mostly back east. But Michael and I are on a tour for trees and climate change from the west coast heading back east. Devastating for me, and as I found out talking with some of the foresters presenting this information for me to use, it's devastating for them too. Everything I'm going to present to you for the first part of this program comes from the Moscow, Idaho Forestry Sciences Laboratory. What this is, is where they're taking the general circulation models like that Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change takes, everybody takes, as to what's going to happen overall the climate, and then on a regional basis, and then they're plugging in the, the needs, species by species, of the trees in the western North America. But when you're there, this is not meant for ordinary citizens, but ordinary citizens can effectively use it. The only thing you need to know, don't click on the zip files, click on the PNGs. Those are the maps that I'm going to be showing you. Uh, what, the maps I'll be showing you here, there's three different uh, general circulation models. The first one they use, and then there's a variety of things under it, uh, is the Canadian one. And it's the one that I clicked on is this green. Not as high as total business as usual, um, but this would be if we got our act together and very few people think that's going to happen. Mm -hmm. So this is what you do when you get to the page, is you will see there are 76 species, and you get a chance to choose whichever species you want to take a look at and look at all the maps. You need pretty high bandwidth to do it. Well, I'm going to start off with Colorado blue spruce, right? And I'll lead you through how you look at the maps. I just took this picture along the Los Pinos River a couple years ago. So here's how to use the maps. Blue spruce now. First of all, the blue lines here, wherever you see them, are based on a 1971 one data assembly that the U.S. Forest Service did of every tree species in general, where you actually find them. And so like all general circulation models, what you do is you try to take different aspects of the habitat and the climate and plug it in and see to what extent you can get the current, what your models would project, um, based on the current. And so there's a pretty good fit here. They have more than 20 different climate indicators they put in. Number of frost-free days, 
uh, how, how cold it gets at night. You know, there's a lot of things that are changing with climate that's not just precipitation, but when precipitation falls and so forth. So they came up with this. This is a pretty good fit for red means this is a really great spot for blue spruce. <coughs> Uh, this yellow-green means it's okay, you find it here too. What they've discovered is anything less than what they call 50% viability, you might as well not even map it, either through interspecies competition or just failing to establish or for one other reason. Uh, it's not going to work out there. Where this model would have blue spruce show up today, and you see it's pretty good. It's pretty good. So then they take that same scenario and they put in what the Canadians say is likely to be in 2030. And 2030 is a very important number because whatever, whether you use the Canadians, the UK, or our own USA NOAA for it, 2030 they're all saying the same thing. The models, the climate models diverge after that point, but 2030 is significant. So here's 2030. Let's just take in the whole. Here's 2030. It's winking out of Arizona and New Mexico. 2060 on this mid-range scenario. And 2090 starting to show up, up in this northern area as well. That's your Colorado for the spruce. I'm going to be showing you nine other species, and they're all kind of like this. Are you ready to think about this happening? All right, we've just done blue spruce. Let's do, we are, here's the other nine that we're going to do. Um, and let's take a look at the other spruce, Engelman spruce. I just took this picture two weeks ago. We were up at about 9,400 feet west of Colorado Springs in the Pikes Peak area. Beautiful Engelman spruce up there. Here's Engelman spruce now. 2030, 2060, 2090. Now obviously, what we see happening here in Colorado is going up the mountains. Engelman spruce. All right, we've covered our two spruce. Let's take a look at, uh, uh, well, let's do Douglas fir. Douglas fir, as you know, is not a true fir. It's just called that. But let's take a look. A very widespread species. I love Douglas fir in part because it's so easy to tell what it is. If I can run my hand over it back and forth, it ain't a spruce, right? <laughs> also, it has these blacks here that have three prongs on the cones. Very easy to recognize. You have some around here, too. Here's Douglas fir now, and truly the first place I got to know Douglas fir. I lived in the Seattle area for five years after I moved down. I was in Alaska for ten. But I assumed Douglas fir was a wet coastal species, and I've been surprised out of my mind here in the interior in the Rocky Mountains seeing where the same species, where it can live. 2030, 2060, 2090. Now, one thing to consider here, as you've seen it retract from this area to where it is now, here's Olympic National Park. It doesn't mean it's going to be treeless. What it means is somebody else is going to be moving in there, okay? If that somebody else can get there. It's projected it's probably going to be redwoods. There were people I knew that already had some redwoods planted on their property. And the, the lore then was about once every 20 years it gets too cold and it kills them back. Well, I've been back there, you know, 20 years later and the trees are still there. White fur now. Take, keep a look at the hole. 2030, 
2060, 2090. Now sometimes I don't know what's going on between 2060 and 2090. I'm kind of hesitant to put the 2090s on there. It's so far out. And depending on what systemic action we take and whether there's economic crashes that wipe us out, it can be hugely different. That's our beautiful white fur. So let's take a look at where we've been. With the blue spruce, the Engelman spruce, the Douglas fir, the white fir. Just take in what's going to be happening to these trees. And what I always like to do when I give this kind of a program, if anything has happened at the human policy level or the discussion level, and it's usually not about, in fact, it's never about trees. The reason you haven't heard about this it's the Forest Service researchers who are talking among themselves, and this is not getting out into the media. But there was a major uh, thing that happened in the New York Times this past Sunday. The top opinion piece op-ed came from uh, Hank Paulson. He was the Treasury Secretary during George W. Bush, and he was there during the housing crash. Look at the title of his op-ed, The Coming Climate Crash. Lessons for Climate Change in the 2008 Recession. It's a must read. It brought me to tears. Yeah, me too. It's now, obviously, he's a Republican. Um, the New York Times has been just amazing over just less than a year how much it puts climate change on the front page now. I want to read just these first four paragraphs uh, from Hank Paulson from this op-ed. There's a time for weighing evidence and a time for acting. And if there's one thing I've learned throughout my work in finance, government, and conservation, it is to act before problems become too big to manage. For too many years, we failed to rein in the excesses building up in the nation's financial markets. When the credit bubble burst in 2008, the damage was devastating. Millions suffered. Many still do. We're making the same mistake today with climate change. We're staring down a climate bubble that poses enormous risks to both our environment and economy. The warning signs are clear and growing more urgent as the risks go unchecked. This is a crisis we can't afford to ignore. I feel as if I'm watching as we fly in a slow motion on a collision course toward a giant mountain. We can see the crash coming and yet we're sitting on our hands rather than altering course. And what he goes on to, to uh, uh, advocate for is the same thing that the great climatologist Jim Hansen has been advocating for for many years. Put a price on carbon. Call it a tax, a fee and dividend, but put a price on carbon so the actual cost to the environment, the economy, of just putting carbon dioxide freely into the atmosphere will no longer be allowed to happen. There will be a price on polluting with carbon. This is big. All right, so back to our trees. These are going to be the, uh, the pines. We'll start down here with the white bark pine. The white bark pine is getting all the press. A, because Yellowstone is losing them, and B, there are two creatures in Yellowstone that absolutely depend on the really large, uh, tasty, fat, rich pine seeds in the white bark pine. One is the Clark's Nutcracker. Now, it can always fly up to Canada or something, but the grizzly bear can't do that. And the grizzly bear absolutely needs them, especially now. I worked in Yellowstone in 1970, and the grizzly bear had two other sources of food that it doesn't have now. One was that was the last year the garbage dumps were in Yellowstone. <laughs> Secondly, I worked at Fishing Bridge. There were trout swimming between Yellowstone Lake and the Yellowstone River under Fishing Bridge because of how they lay their babies in the, um, in the lake and then they, when they, the babies get big enough they come on down the river. Somebody, after I worked there in 1970, put lake trout into Yellowstone Lake. The lake trout have been eating the uh, cutthroat trout, and so there's hardly any in the rivers anymore. 
The bears cannot go to the rivers and fish. So, of course, we're concerned. But white bark pine is, is a real problem there. Take a look at the hole, and in fact, actually this one here, you might as well just kind of really keep a watch on Yellowstone here while you're also sort of watching here. White bark pine now, 2030, now remember, nobody disputes that this is what 2030 is going to look like. So whatever happens in 2060 and 2090, this is baked into the system. This is going to happen. It is happening. 2060. 2090. Oh. Huge concern. Yeah. Does that model reflect the effect of uh, pine bark beetles on the white bark pine? That's Good the question. Does this effect uh, uh, reflect pine bark beetles? Yeah. Basically, what it reflects is that once the climate starts to change, the trees are vulnerable to whatever native insects, fungi, microbes. Uh, viruses are around, and so certainly the beetles would be part of it. I mean, that's obviously, that's what we can see in terms of the climate manifestation, is the beetles. We're not getting that minus 40 degrees winter kill anymore. And sometimes, rather than two turnovers of populations, three in a year. So yes, how these things go out, and in fact, when they say this, um, some of these species, you'll have ancient ones be able to hold on and hold on for maybe 100, 150 years for some things, but their young won't be able to establish. Or it'll be the opposite. The young can establish and the old ones will go out like with the beetles. So there are all kinds of things that could take out these trees. But what the Forest Service is telling us is that this drops below ideal and gets down into the barely serviceable. And what we can see right now is in the barely serviceable, they're vulnerable to pine beetles. Let's take a look at another high altitude pine, Rocky Mountain Bristlecone Pine. Uh, this is a picture I took about a month ago when I um, found it on a high ridge on the slope of Mount Blanca on the east side of the San Luis Valley. Just beautiful. Rocky Mountain Bristlecone, now there's a, a Great Basin Bristlecone, they're all cousins, uh, but they're considered distinct species. Nonetheless, if they got back together, they could probably interbreed. Very, very small um, range here. So let's take a look at where it goes. 2030, remember this is baked in, baked in, 2060, 29. Wow. I just took this picture about a week ago, 9,400 feet west of Colorado Springs. And one of the things that's so wonderful, I love it when a tree is easy to identify. Uh, when you see these white specks on the underside of a five-needled high altitude, you got yourself a bristle cone, a Rocky Mountain bristle cone. All right, continuing with the pines. Let's go to another high altitude mountain pine, Limber Pine. I love limber pine. I brought some specimens of this, as well as the uh, Rocky Mountain Bristlecone that you see over there. And one of the things I love about limber pine is where I was uh, for the past couple weeks at 9,400 feet. I get up on the ridge, and I see dwarfed ones, and where they can only hold on to their needles at the end. Limber pine. Here's where I was. So let's take a look again, uh, the overall, keep your eyes looking at the overall. Look at it wink out in Nevada, almost out of Utah, except the Uintas. Gone from Utah. Mm -hmm. All right, limber pine. Let's go up to lodgepole pine, okay? This one's really widespread. Well, obviously, this has been having problems all the way up into British Columbia as well. I didn't take this picture, but it's certainly very characteristic of the lodgepole forest. So keep your eyes on the hole as we go from now to 2030, 2060, 
29. And again, it's all based on what the U.S. Forest Service is not just doing with these maps, but they are producing papers now, publishing in the top journals on a species-by-species -species basis that you can go and read exactly what's going on. So, lodgepole pine. We've got two more to go here. Let's take someone very different from the mountain species that we've been looking at. Let's look at the pinion pine. Let's see what's going to go on there. A lot of us have heard about the beetle kill in the Santa Fe area. Michael and I were there about two months ago. Uh, spent about a week in Santa Fe. Wow, did I see it. Mm -hmm. Let's take a look at pinion pine. Mm -hmm. I took this picture in the Santa Fe area. Pinion pine now. Okay, obviously not quite the mountain species, but it certainly needs some slope to it. So here we are now. Keep your eyes on the hole. 2030. Whoa, what's happening up there? 2060. 2090. If pinion pine can't make it here, what's it going to be like? You guys going to be like living in Phoenix? Is that what it's going to be? I don't know. I'm just raising these questions because this is really bothersome to me. This, this is frightening. And I don't know why the media isn't doing something like this. It's the forest researchers. And when I, when I talk to them, I mean, they are as freaked out as I am. And they're really happy I'm doing this kind of a program because they want the word to get out. Well, we've got one left. Let's see what happens to the ponderosa, our beloved ponderosa pond. Mm -hmm. I took this picture on the slope of Mount Blanca, very low down the San Luis Valley, uh, about three years ago. That's Michael. Ponderosa pine now, wow, just take that in. Obviously, when you get over in Washington, any of you, like, you come over Snoqualmie Pass and boom, you're heading east and suddenly you're into that dry country, the <coughs> ponderosa pine. So, they call it all one species, but we'll get into what the genetics mean on that. So here we are now, taking the hole, there's 2030. 2060, 20. Not too bad. That's what we would expect to ponderosa pine, right? We would have because it, it's so low down now and it can get by in such an area. All it has to do is follow the Douglas firs up and the, and the blue spruces up and take their place, you know? And we're okay to some extent. Mm -hmm. So here's a picture I took last winter of that same tree. Here's where woodpeckers have been up here extracting the beetles. The whole tree is dead now. Um, the community is, um, is trying to log out to the extent that they can find any loggers. The loggers are so busy now. Everybody, every subdivision is trying to bring in the loggers take out the trees, especially the ones that are still alive, <coughs> have the beetles in them, but they haven't come out yet. Really hard to find loggers to come in and, and take the trees, even gorgeous ones. And yes, they did manage to get a crew of three loggers to come in here. Unfortunately, it's after the bark beetles have already started to leave again and attack new trees uh, for the summer, but at least they're going to be able to take down the trees um, that are already destroyed. Now, in addition to loggers, what this community has done for the very first time is they put on this. This is a pheromone pack. It's the same pheromones, the little chemicals that go through the air that bark beetles use to signal, hey, this is my tree. It's fully occupied. No more beetles needed here. So it's, it's, a, it's a way to confuse the bark beetles. They'll probably have to put a new package on every spring, every year. But meanwhile, meanwhile, they are taking out the dead trees, they are taking out the Douglas firs like this one and the ponderosa pines that already have bark beetle evidence in them. And we're hoping that's going to mean 
uh, that some of these trees will be able to survive the bark beetles. But again, again, as climate change happens, um, the first thing you see happening with climate change is that the trees are no longer able to fight off native species such as these dendroctinous bark beetles. Who would have guessed the subdivision we live in? Um, the, we just stay with friends during the winter. They had a covenant in there. No one can cut any trees without approval of the board. Not one. Hmm. Boy, has that changed over the last three years. I've been doing fire mitigation out there, thinning the forest. Now everyone is doing it. Standing here by two Douglas firs that have orange lines put around them here when the Colorado State Forester in the Alamosa area came out here and worked with the people in the subdivision to decide how to mark which trees for the loggers to take down. So these two, later this week, will be coming down. Amazing to be at a time when the sound of the chainsaw actually sounds like a melody in my ears because I know how important it is to get these beetle-killed trees out of here for the health of the rest of the forest. just covered these 10 trees here. I want to go back to ponderosa pine because ponderosa pine doesn't look too bad, does it? I mean, compared to some of the other ones, you know, we're, it's going to be okay. Well, there are two reasons why the forester uh, just wrote a trilogy of papers published in Forest Ecology Management Journal, three papers, this spring. And this is the language that he used. Potential impacts range from pronounced to dire. This is in an academic paper. On pon actually, it's a combination of ponderosa pine and Douglas fir. Not looking at anything over here, but just our interior, what's considered the interior subspecies of ponderosa pine and Douglas fir. The reason he said pronounced to dire is that these areas are not necessarily where the trees will be. It's just where they should be. <clears throat> it's where they should be. The genetics of the trees down here may be inappropriate. And in general, what they concluded in this paper is that what a forester would do if they were clear-cutting and then coming back and reseeding with seed transfer guidelines, which have not been updated in the U.S. yet, they have in Canada, they would be taking their seeds from about 300 miles south. <coughs> That's what they would be replanting with. Certainly from a much lower elevation. Uh, Canada is about, they do meters there, so it's about 200 meters lower elevation, and about 200 kilometers they're now doing reaching down into Montana to get seed stock for replanting in southern mm -hmm. Canada. So, the genetics may not simply just cruise up a mountain because it's not just temperature, there's other things about when you put out your pollen, um, how you respond to first frost or last frost, all these kind of things that trees have had a chance to adapt to for millions, thousands of years since the Ice Age have had a chance to adapt. And then, slow dispersal. So two things. You can't just take the babies of the existing trees and necessarily move them up slow and expect it's going to be okay. And um, if we're not involved, the natural dispersal rate is going to be too slow. So if you think these maps were scary, I'm going to show you a scarier thing now, put out by the IPCC, end of March. It was working group two on adaptation, impacts, vulnerability. In the summary report, they had this figure. Now I added the green here. Take in this figure. 
You see the icons of the different creatures? The higher the bar, the faster these creatures can move in tandem with climate change. Now there's two things that make for moving fast. One is, what is your generation time? You know, if you're a rabbit, what do you have, two generations a year, something like that? And so then your babies can move and then they can move again. Trees, on average, they consider a 30-year generation time. Certainly for our alpine species, way more than that. So you get one chance every 30 years to create seeds. And then how do those seeds move uphill or move north? Now, here's a lot of you have Siberian elms here. Probably most of these Siberian elms weren't planted. They just made their way here, right? They're, you know, Siberian elm, willow, cottonwood, anything that flies on the wind doesn't need our help. But anything that depends on an animal, like squirrels, to move their seeds, they're going to need our help. So take a look at what we have here. There's no form of creature that's slower than trees. Okay? Now, these are mollusks, so this would be aquatic, <laughs> freshwater mollusks. In here, you think of snail space, right? They're pretty fast. Obviously, there's no, they did not bother to put birds on there. Because if you're not flightless, you can go anywhere. Okay? So birds are not represented on there. Along the right are the various different uh, climate scenarios based on these general circulation models, okay? These are the different ones, the various scenarios. And look at where the median is here for trees. There is only one, and this is probably totally outdated now, where trees could possibly keep up with climate change. Trees are the most vulnerable of any life form. They provide the scaffolding of everything that isn't a grassland or a desert. Everything depends on the trees being able to, to follow climate change. Yeah? So, so I guess a way to summarize the, the differences um, would be that if you have a slope, you can change climate without having to go very many kilometers. Yeah, uphill. Yeah, but if you're on the flat, then you have to move a lot of kilometers, so it's harder for the trees to keep up with the climate change. Yes, exactly. and those of us who work in the Appalachians, which are much gentler mountains, uh, and in the flat Midwest, I'm in Michigander, why is it in another way easier for us? because the trees never have to come down slope to make it to the next northernmost mountain, right? This is that Sky Island effect, that you go, uh-oh, climate's changing, and you go uphill, you go uphill, and pretty soon everybody's standing on the top of your 14,000 foot peaks. Mm -hmm. You're out of hill. And you can't go back down and say, oops, we should have gone north. Okay, so there's difference in the west, yes, in the short term, they can go uphill in the way that in Michigan they can't. We're, where I grew up, we're losing our boreal forest. It's just astonishing how fast it's going. The southern end of the boreal in mid-Michigan is going away. But there, they don't get stuck on a dead-end route unless there's a great lake in front of them or something, you know? Yeah. And so is that why in the, the Rocky Mountain bristle cone, it, it looked like it just disappeared from Colorado and didn't go anywhere else? Yeah, good point. That would be the sort of the really case study on that. Because it can't. It's, it's, it's just not going to think, oh my God, I see the mountains over here and, you know, head down and over the next 500 years so I'll have enough babies to make it. You see how this all just, I mean, I never used to have to think this way. But once you step into this, you start looking at your mountains and your forests in a very different way. And again, you're, you're following the logic of this, exactly. And it's very scary. Here's a, another piece just to put into perspective how fast is fast, okay? I've done work in paleoecology, so I come at this not from a standpoint of an ecologist, but paleoecology. When you're into 
paleoecology deep time, things are a lot different in terms of how you think of speed. Okay? I'm doing some work on a, um, a form of juniper, alligator juniper, and so I went online and I found this really wonderful review article. Cenozoic climate change shaped the evolutionary ecophysiology of the Cupressaceae conifers. Okay, juniper is part of the, um, that family. Here's the Cenozoic, okay, so the dinosaurs died off here 65 million years ago. The Mesozoic is down here. Cenozoic is here. Uh, very warm in the Eocene, hugely warm. And then something happened. Geographers, paleogeographers, think they could pinpoint how the land mass has shifted um, that made all the difference. But something happened here where there was a rapid cooling into the Oligocene. Okay? Let's take a look at what they mean when they say rapid. That plants had to adjust to. Global climate underwent dramatic changes 33.7 million years ago. That's going into the Oligocene when a warm and almost universally equable world <coughs> rapidly became much colder and drier. Um, these are just footnotes. This shift is attributed in part to a dramatic decrease in atmospheric <coughs> CO2 that caused global mean temperatures to drop 3 to 4 degrees C in only 300,000 years. Now, the aim, I see you smiling, you know what I'm talking about here. <coughs> Three to four degrees C, up, up about 15 years ago, up until maybe three years ago or so, people, especially in Europe, were aiming for a total, since the Industrial <coughs> Revolution, about 1850 or so, of two degrees C through 2100, and then we'd get our act together by then. And, it would just be 2 degrees C. Now, we're just pulling at straws, trying to keep it at 3 degrees C, and some people are saying, given the way governments are working, and given the, the way the developing countries are moving, or the lack of anything happening here in the USA, it's going to be 4 degrees C. 4 degrees C over the course of 200 years. Three to four degrees C in only 300,000 years. This is what our trees are used to. This was tough. They made it. They used to be part of the whole northern hemisphere, um, arcto tertiary kind of circumpolar forest, and then they kind of split off. But most of them, you know, they made it. The genera made it and got a lot of species. I can't handle that. I cannot handle that. I don't know about you, this freaks me out and it freaks out the foresters who are making these maps and doing these papers, but the only thing that's going to work with this is to have people worried about our economy. Okay? Unfortunately, I think that's happening. Even so, do you see how humans are going to have to work at this? John Muir never thought we'd have to do this. Aldo Leopold never thought we'd have to do this. I'm old, I won't really have to do this, but your grandkids will. So even, even two years ago, there was the World Bank is basically saying, four degrees, no, turn down the heat. We, we cannot have this happen. And they didn't even care about the trees. <clears throat> they weren't talking about the trees. They were talking about everything but the trees. Now, there's a reason why Canada is so far ahead of the U.S. in terms of their foresters. I'm going to show you what Canada is doing. But when we talk about 3 degrees C, that's kind of a global average. There'll be some parts that stay pretty much as they are, but in general, this is what it looks like. For 3 degrees C, in the latitudes that we're at now, now obviously in this area, uh, you're going to have a lot more. You already have had a lot more than the 0.8 degrees C. That is, the globe has gone up since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. But in general, in our latitudes, this is where you see it expressed. The tropics are only going to go up 1 degree C. They will have taller thunderheads 
that go higher up, the stratosphere will be pushed higher up, and then they will be dumping down, and deserts will be moving north. There was just a paper published that the tropics are moving poleward about 35 mi uh, miles per decade. <coughs> so the deserts are moving north as well, the desert zone. And then, of course, up here, this is where we've been seeing all the melting going on. Did you know that in January, January 29th, back when everybody in Michigan and New Jersey were complaining about the polar vortex, remember that? Well, when air comes down, it's got to go up somewhere else. We had a pretty warm last winter here in Colorado. Uh, but it went way up, Fairbanks. And they actually had rain January 29th on the Arctic Slope well above the Arctic Circle in the mountains, the Brooks Range. Rain. The native peoples never had that in their oral tradition. <coughs> so much changing. So this is why we hear so much here. Um, of course, then you wonder, what's, <laughs> how do you take the heat from down here and get it up here? Ah, hurricanes, more tornadoes, ocean currents, whatever. We're going to see this stuff. So here's what the Canadians are doing, because they're feeling it more. Those provinces go way, way to the north. Uh, British Columbia got it started. It's called the Assisted Migration Adaptation Trial. Assisted migration is the term used for when we humans intervene, and we say, trees, I'm going to help you move north. Bristlecone pine, I know you're not going to head down this valley, but I'm going to help you move north into Wyoming. Know? That's assisted migration, any time they do this. Now, um, this was put together, in fact, let me read this. Approximately 300 million tree seedlings are planted in the western USA, British Columbia, and Yukon each year. Many climatologists are predicting that the climate could be 3 to 4 degrees C warmer when those trees are harvested 60 to 80 years after planting. So the timber industries, business, business is the ones that aren't in climate denial. One business after another is saying uh, uh, climate is real. So this is the timber industry. So they're doing 15 tree species. Here's the tree species that they're testing. Um, and take a look, Alberta's in it, and duh, state of Alaska. They've already replanted the Kenai Peninsula with a species of lodgepole pine that doesn't even exist there. It's the coast lodgepole. So they are into this here. And what they're doing in an adaptation trial is they are taking some of these trees and planting them up in the boreal forest to see how well they can do. Because in timber companies, if you've got a 60 to 80 year rotation, do you plant a seedling? One third of the way into climate change, if it's got to live through that degree, they're testing it. The scariest thing, they're taking all these species, seed stock from British Columbia, and they're testing some plots in southern Oregon and northern California. Why? Why would they, if climate's warming, test British Columbia seeds in northern California? on experimental plots. Yes? Uh, well, they, they give some idea of their their viability range. Uh, so they put them in conditions mm -hmm. that maybe are the most stressful, and if they could make it there, then they could make it maybe in somewhere in between. Oh, close. <coughs> they are expecting the climate of Northern California to possibly reach British Columbia within 80 years. They want to see if their seeds can grow in that kind of climate, right? This is frightening. Here's what Greg O'Neill, one of the heads of this program in British Columbia, they got started on this about eight years ago. <coughs> he said, foresters are no longer planning for today's climate. They're planning for the climate 60 to 80 years from now, when it is expected to be 3 to 4 degrees C warmer. Now, a lot of these provinces, they do timber a lot more than we do here. We do more multiple use. We have wilderness areas. We value our old growth trees. It's not just get them up to a certain height and then cut them down. So 
So it's no wonder that they're starting with this before we are. In my view, in my view, what's going to happen to a standard wilderness types, as I've been, I was part of uh, the wilderness movement in southeast Alaska, uh, for getting all that designated, and during the Jimmy Carter era and so forth. I have had to totally transform my view of human intervention. Totally. That last point brings me to the first lesson of this episode five. Worldview shifts can happen quickly. They certainly have for me. And that's especially true when I experience something locally uh, that takes me out of my old understandings. And that brings us to lesson number two. Climate change becomes real locally. And that is, while some of us have been able to accept that climate change is real and put it at the top of our list of priorities for what concerns us, what actions we want to take to leave, to leave a legacy that we're proud of for future generations, for that to happen for many people, um, they have to feel it. They have to feel it locally, especially if they've already gravitated to a worldview that says climate change isn't real. So local experience is very important, and that's certainly been the case here in Colorado for the many, many people who are experiencing the death of their local trees. Now that brings us to lesson three, and lesson three is this. Opportunities to act are crucial. Opportunities to act are crucial both for accepting that climate change is real and for feeling you need to do something, you need to be in action. And so, for example, you've already seen some pictures of the pheromone patches that people here in Colorado have just started applying to their trees. Here on Mount Blanca, uh, the residents here have been applying the patches to ponderosa pine. They've also been applying it to Douglas fir. And when we were in the Durango area, it was blue spruce that was receiving the pheromone packets there. Here's a little video clip uh, that I took just this morning of my husband pointing out a packet on a ponderosa pine. And then we're going to pan back and you'll see uh, what it looks like, some of the areas where I have used a handsaw over the past three winters to thin out the regrowth forest, mostly Rocky Mountain juniper, in order to allow those trees that do survive to have a better chance of acquiring groundwater, rainfall that falls, and therefore to perhaps fight off the various insect pests coming their way. But again, this is climate change. And pheromone packs um, are in a way, they're sort of like hospice for forests. That is that it may allow the trees to survive now, but for the next generations, uh, these trees are probably on their way out and there'll be other species that will be replacing them while these species move uphill. The fourth and final lesson is that climate effects on old growth and wilderness forests will be heartbreaking. The question about consequences of climate change for forests and wilderness areas was in fact one of the main questions that I asked at the outset of this series in the introductory session. I really wondered what it meant if we needed to be hands off in wilderness areas, what that would mean. I mean, if foresters could go into the rest of the forest and plant seeds from further south or seeds from altogether more southerly species, they would have a chance of adapting to climate change, but in wilderness areas, it's supposed to be hands off, pretty much so. What I've learned from talking with foresters is that it's sort of a moot question, and for this very practical reason. The foresters, especially given how much of the budget now goes to fighting forest fires, the U.S. Forest Service has very little money left over for planting trees, reseeding, um, even doing the kind of research and boots on the ground experience necessary for evaluating what do we do? What do we do for helping the forest adapt? 
So overall, it means we don't need to consider changes in management of wilderness areas right now. There isn't enough money, there isn't enough seed stock to even apply all the management necessary in the multiple use areas of the U.S. national forests. Now before I close out this episode five, I'd like to acknowledge the people here in Colorado who have allowed us to stay in their homes and to access their magnificent forests. This field experience for me has been absolutely vital in addition to the online research and the communications I've had with the professionals. So here they are. Here on Mount Blanca, on the east side of the San Luis Valley of Colorado. I'd like to thank Tyra and John Barnes for their hospitality. Near Pikes Peak, west of Colorado Springs, I'd like to thank Heather and Leon Kelly. And finally, in the San Juan Mountains near Durango, along the Los Pinos River, I'd like to thank Ken and Lois Carpenter. And one more acknowledgement, too, for the woman who made it possible for me to speak on forestry issues and climate at the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Durango, Colorado. That's Mary Oaken, so thanks, Mary. To close out this episode five, Requiem for Engelman Spruce at Wolf Creek Pass. I'm going to be using music from Wagner's Tristan and Isolde. Uh, that's the music I love to contemplate death. And this is a deathly scene you will be seeing of the Engelman Spruce, centuries old forest of Engelman Spruce, now standing the vertical dead at Wolf Creek Pass. <laughs>